One thing the pandemic showed us is that if you force thousands of companies to think differently in the space of like a week, they will pivot and they will make it happen. Why can't we just do that for everyone? Why can't we do that for people who have different ideas of how work should be, should be performed? Welcome to The Defense Never Rests with Morgan and Akins, your monthly dose of uncommon sense about all things legal and some that are not. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Defense Never Rest. I am your host, Trisha Baxter. Today's topic is a tough one. It's really what's going on in the world right now the, the, with George Floyd and the riots and the protests and, and the underlying racial injustice. What happened to George Floyd was horrific. I mean, we watched a man slowly die before our own eyes on national television at the hands of someone we are supposed to trust. I don't even know how to process that. I've been silent since. Not to my friends and family. They all know how I feel. But I've been silent, silent publicly for the most part on social media, which is unusual for me. I'm pretty big on LinkedIn, but I've struggled to put out what I feel into words in a way that doesn't sound like a load of BS. So rather than do that, I decided to do a podcast. I feel like I can do a podcast authentically. You can hear the tone of my voice. You can see my gestures. Um, and I've had several people over the past couple of days kind of give me words of warning about doing a podcast like this. Stuff like this is a business podcast, talking to clients, potential clients, potential referral sources, resources. You may risk alienating them. There's some of the topics, uh, comments that I've gotten, and I get it. And to that, I say this. Yes, that is definitely a risk. But I tend to give our clients, potential clients, referral sources, our listeners, way more credit than that. Maybe that makes me naive because most people I know want to know what they can do to help. They want to be part of these conversations too. So bottom line, we need to have a dialogue, a real one. And we have a podcast. So to not talk about what's going on just didn't seem authentic to me. And that dialogue should be driven really by diverse individuals. So that's what we're going to do today. Joining me are two phenomenal guests. First up is Alexis Robertson. She is the diversity and inclusion specialist at Foley and Lardner in Chicago. Her second time on, she is back by popular demand. Alexis Robertson, welcome back. How are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me back. So we got on a podcast. We filmed a podcast about diversity and inclusion about two months ago, and it aired went live about four days before George Floyd passed away, died. Uh, and I, when this happened, when the film came out, the footage of George Floyd came out, I reached out to you and I said, I would love for you to come back on and kind of talk about what's going on. And you instantly and very humbly said, I'm happy to do that, but I actually have a guest that's better at it. And Michelle Silverthorne is who you suggested. And I looked at her and I reached out or you reached out and you, and you got her on. And I, I was so thankful for that. And and, I, and we both, Michelle and I both were like, we want you on too. So I'm happy that you're joining us for a second time. Um, your podcast episode, I think I told you today, is the second fastest growing. And that was before all this happened. So um, I, I'm so happy that you're back on. You're such a hit. So welcome. No, oh, thank you. So you uh, introduced Michelle to me. Why don't you tell the, our audience how you know her and, and bring her on in? Well, I thought it was important to bring in Michelle for a couple of reasons, because we've talked about my background and what I currently do, which is I'm Director of Diversity and Inclusion at a law firm, just one law firm, whereas Michelle is an outside consultant and diversity expert who's really working to help numerous organizations and law firms in general about diversity, but also highly in demand at this time. I personally know Michelle because we both went to the University of Michigan Law School. Go Blue. So I think, go Blue, exactly. So we became acquainted with each other there, but prior after that just both being in this space we've gotten to know each other quite well I think consider each other to be pretty good friends and she's a tremendous resource so I will let her talk a bit more about her background I know I think I covered mine in the last podcast or maybe I should recap it but yeah Michelle's an awesome resource and I'm so happy we could have her here well, welcome, oh. Michelle. Welcome Thanks. to the podcast. Thanks, Trisha. I also, I, I, Alexis didn't mention, but you did say very briefly that you thought I was better than Alexis. And I really want to go back to that um, as the truth of life. But, it's true. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> She's a uh, dog for a reason. I mean, gosh, I just, the, the, the hierarchy of, of, of Black diversity professionals, Alexis. There's like, it's like the Hunger Games of us. Um, no, really, thanks for having me on. I, I practiced law for many years. Alexis and I graduated around the same time she she graduated about, I think, what, six months before I did. And the reason I left large law firms is because I was tired of the BS. I was tired of being told that 
people who look like me are the reasons that lawyers, black lawyers don't succeed. And the issue is me and something to do with me and has nothing to do with the workplace that we are in. So what I wanted to do was really have our, those hard conversations about what does it mean to be black? And by extension, what does it mean to be a minority in a large law firm where it is so easy for us to be creative for our clients, but it is so hard for us to be creative for change among ourselves. And how do we create that change and how do we sustain that change? And um, it's been a tough week and I will talk about that in a sec. But for years, I have been trying to tell people that we need to stop making the business case for diversity. We have to talk, talk about how people matter and how individuals matter and their lives matter. And that's why we need, want them to succeed. And if anything else, after this month, I'm hoping that I will never, ever have to convince someone of that again. So thank you for having me on and let's have a conversation. Yeah, I think that's that's the most important part is just to have the, well, not the most, it's the first step is to have the conversation. And I'm so mm -hmm. looking forward to get educated myself. Yes. So so Michelle went to Princeton for college, the University of Michigan for law school, but also grew up outside of the United States. And so in our friendship, as we've gotten to know each other, we both, we agree on a lot, but we bring two different perspectives. I am African-American and that my family, my origin is that of essentially slavery in the United States. All of my fam family has grown up here and I have what may be considered the prototypical African-American experience in the United States. Whereas Michelle, I think, brings this tremendous perspective of somebody who was not a U.S. citizen, grew up in, in Jamaica, right? Yes, Jamaica and Trinidad. I'm a Caribbean Black. Very different experience. Yes. And, it, and, it's, and I think potentially, I don't know if we'll touch on this, but it shows how the Black experience isn't necessarily monolithic mm -hmm. and how we do, you know, share very similar things, but we may bring different perspectives, which is why I thought it was so tremendous to have her join us today. Yeah, I think one, you know, the reason I do talk about race a lot, I grew up in a country that is in Jamaica that is, I think, about 95% Black. I also grew up in another country, Trinidad and Tobago, which is very, very racially, ethnically diverse. Um, and in both countries, we talk about race. Like, we talk about race. It is not something that we avoid talking about. It cannot be something we avoid talking about. We talk about it in the ways that actually are kind of uncomfortable. And people would probably call them, you know, a little different here in the States. So, and it's interesting when Alexis talked about the differences, there is, there is a study, and I'll just end here because it has a lot to do with what we're doing today, about first generation Caribbean Blacks when they come to West Indian Blacks, when they come to America, and their mental health, and their, you know, the internal trauma that they feel. It's a lot less than African American Blacks. But the next generation, it gets worse. And then the next generation, it gets worse. Because as we go from generation to generation, as we stay in this country, we are incorporating that racial trauma as well. And that racial trauma is real. If you want a way to measure it, you can measure it by comparing West Indian Black first generations to West Indian Black third generations. And that is what we are talking about. We need to understand how that racial trauma affects people, how it excludes people, how it isolates people, and how in this country it has killed so many people. So that's a conversation I'm hoping we have now. Well, I, I love the, your two different perspectives coming to this, right? And not all Black women share the same perspective. So mm -hmm. I think having you come on here and, and have that different layered approach, I think is great. Well, let's jump in. Um, what was your very first thought when you saw the video of George Floyd? It took me a long time to watch it. I, we, we live in a society now where you can mistakenly run across someone being murdered um, without having agreed to view it because people share everything on Facebook. And like, I have not watched the full Ahmad Arbery video for that reason, but for some reason, I hit a point one evening where I was like, I'm, I'm going to watch this. And um, it's very difficult to watch. I mean, you really do watch someone go lifeless. And I will point out, Trisha, and not at all to to say anything negative about your intro, but when you first raised this, you mentioned that that Mr. Floyd died or passed away. I know. And, You're right? absolutely right. You're absolutely right. right. And and I, I caught and myself. It's, it's very hard for us to say when he was murdered, but that that is what happened. We've captured a murder on film. It was by no means one of the first that's been captured on film. I'm certain it's not going to be one of the, the last of, you know, an unarmed black man or black person by law enforcement, but it's it's very difficult to watch. I think you're watching life essentially leave someone's body and not to, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know his technical time of death, but that was how I viewed it. I found it very difficult, completely unjustified. Um, but for whatever reason, I was able to make it to the end and I don't do that very often anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's important for me to stress because these types of videos 
happen a lot. Yeah, I agree. I well, I've watched, gosh, I don't know, seven of them. I and the thing is, I remember every one of them. I haven't finished George Floyd's. I'm going to be honest. I can't. I have tried one, two, three, three times in the last four days to do it. Uh, maybe tonight will be the night where I can finish it. But it's hard, and I imagine what it must have been like to be the person holding that video camera, to holding that phone. I don't remember her name, but the one who was very brave to do that. Um, it, it is. It is traumatic to do that. It is traumatic to be the witness to that and to know that you, if you try to intervene, if you try to say something, you will be the person who that anger and that violence will be turned to next. And so I have nothing but admiration for that young woman. And she has been harassed and terrorized and treated like crap for the past um, two weeks. And so I just want to acknowledge her as well. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. She has been. Oh, I wasn't aware of that either. She has been asked, why didn't she intervene? Why didn't she do more? Why could she, how could she just stand there and watch a man die? And um, I can understand what she did and I can yeah. understand how she did and I can understand well, how it makes I, you immobile. And I will say towards, I don't know how, at what point in the video, but you do eventually start hearing bystanders yelling, just yelling mm -hmm. that he's saying he can't breathe. He can't. Mm -hmm. And that is where... I mean, I know we're going to work to unpack this, but it's very hard for me to understand the mindset at that point of law enforcement, given that they're, they're being notified repeatedly over, over many minutes. So that it, it adds to why it's very, very difficult to watch. Well, I, well, I'm with you on that. And, and I'm not trying to diminish it by moving on, but I, I, I do want to get to the larger picture here mm -hmm. um, to have that discussion. Um, can we talk about the source of the anger that under is underlying everything that's going on right now with the protests and the riots and the reactions? What's, what's the source of that? I mean, for me, the source of it has always been the devaluation of Black lives in America. And it has long been the devaluation of Black lives in America. And, you know, I mean, when I started this work would have been, gosh, I don't know, 20, 2012. 2013 when I started this, I remember exactly where I was in 2013 when Trayvon Martin, the jury came back on his life. When the jury, and I can remember it because it was about a month after I became a U.S. citizen. And then to listen to a jury of my newest peers telling me that this black boy's life didn't matter. And not only that, to listen for the past year on everyone, all the, the pundits and the media and the, uh, and the defense counsel, all just saying that, you know what? He deserved it. He deserved to die. And then what happens after that, you know, the, the, the many, 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 many murders that we have witnessed and had seen videos of realizing over and over again that, you know, your life, it isn't an important, it isn't as important as mine. And we have used our police force for too long as a way to keep what we say law and order, right? But it's also a way to continue to dehumanize people to dehumanize especially poor black people, because let's be realistic what we're also talking about. We are also talking about poor black people. And we continue to use a police force to do things that social services should be doing, that mental health professionals should be doing, that we should not be using state sanctioned violence for. And the way that we train them and the way that we um, allow them the power to devalue lives. And it isn't just something, and this is what Alexis and I talk about, isn't just something that exists in the police force. It's something that exists across this country. It is a disease and it has existed for 400 years. And finally, you know, between the pandemic and between the job numbers and between who are essential workers and who are being laid off, there was a movement. And then there was a voice that came stronger and stronger in this country that said, today is the day where it's enough. And so I think that that is what is behind that. I think it is, you know, I hope it continues and I hope that voice continues carrying strongly, but that's what I am seeing here. Yeah. It's really hard to know in the sense that like we've said a number of times, this is not the first video and this is not the first time that this sort of violence has happened in the United States, right? As Michelle said, we have a long history of it. But something happened where, in a way, that was the straw, the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. And it wasn't, you know, other other names, you know, it wasn't um, Ahmaud Arbery. It wasn't Breonna Taylor. And I could just keep naming so many names. And I don't know if it's a combination of what's already been going on with the pandemic and we're all at home and consuming a lot of media, but yes. And also maybe very much the circumstances here were so just 
visceral and it's Callous. clearly someone who's Callous. incapacitated. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it was really something that was so undeniable. There wasn't that thing where you could say, well, maybe if that person wasn't running, well, maybe if they hadn't lunged, well, maybe if they hadn't reached for, because I feel like often we're, we're people try to twist the facts and the facts here were just so apparent that we couldn't deny it. And the, the other thing, as much as the, these sentiments aren't new, it's that we have people protesting and there's, there's activity that you can't ignore. But I think another very difficult thing for, you know, not to speak for the black community, but for the black community is this has been going on for so long. It's just that, that the majority has now decided to notice. Mm-hmm. And, they are, and more are joining in fighting and protesting for what are, you know, at their core, their human rights violations. Mm-hmm. So it is interesting in that it has tapped in to this broader cultural pain trauma. But at the same time, for a Black person in America, we look and we're like, yeah, I know. And I think in a way, many of us are scratching our heads also being like, oh, I wonder why now everybody's noticed because nothing's mm-hmm. different for me than it was a month ago. But um, it's, it, it's, it, it is really interesting. Yeah, I think, I mean, you get the, it it was the time and it was the place, right? But it was also the video. Like, I mean, it's just, it's callous. It's cruel. It is, it is inhumane. And and then you, and you're told like, well, that's how they're trained. They're trained to do chokeholds, right? And they're trained to, you know, subdue a suspect for a $20 counterfeit bill. That is worth a man's life. That that's what you're doing it for. Because if that's the case, then you tell me, what does it take to be innocent as a black person in America? Like, what does it take? At what point does my life actually, is it, is it a value to you? Like I am eating Skittles walking home and that's not valuable to you. What, what is, I'm playing with a BB gun. I am sitting in my car reaching for my wallet. At what point am I perfect enough? Like at what point is anyone perfect enough to not be, you know, exposed to that lethal violence? And that is what I think, you know, between the pandemic, between this whole, you know, the, it being an election year, you know, we are all, our tensions are raised, our protests are raised. And I think having white colleagues and white friends realize that this is the cost of privilege. Like you can live in this privilege your entire life and without recognizing how much it hurts other people for you to have it. And I think finally we are recognizing that. Do you, do you see, it, when you look, when you take a look at the past two or three weeks, ha, is this bigger than what you've seen before? Or is this like the reaction fall in line with the other reactions that you've seen? Oh, this is definitely bigger than what our country's seen before. I mean, we have to throw back to the civil rights movement to the 1960s. In that case, yes, we've we've seen it before (laughs) at that that level. But there's definitely been, you know, other protests. I think for a lot of people, Ferguson may still be relatively fresh in their mind. And there may have been some other, you know, protests at the time, but nothing on the level of, I think it was 140 U.S. cities and also globally. This is definitely at a, a, a different level in terms of the outcry and the response. And I mean, I wasn't alive in 1963. So I don't know, like, were there white parents reaching, talking to their children about race and privilege? Were there black children speaking up at 12 years old about what it feels like to be black in America? Were there millions of people marching in solidarity across the globe in favor of black rights in America? I don't know. Maybe, maybe that was the case. But like for my lifetime, I have never, ever, ever seen anything like this. Yeah. I do have my mother saying it feels like the 60s mm-hmm. and my, my grandmother, who's 92, agreeing with her. Yes, there you wow. go. That's pretty powerful. And the other thing that I've noticed, I've never seen this happen in the prior, when, when videos like this have hit the media, because not that they don't all hit the media, but when they have, I don't remember so much of focus being on white privilege. And I think mm-hmm. that's what I, was, what I see differently now is, all right, let's not just talk about um, the black culture, we have to talk about the white privilege. So mm-hmm. I think that's maybe new. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've I mean, seen a lot more. Yeah, you spend the year, I mean, that's since I've been in this for a long time, right? And we, you try, you, you know how to get people to talk. It, no one is going to change unless they change their own minds. Like you cannot force a single person to change unless they are legislated to change or unless they willingly change their mind. That's the only way. Like, you know, everyone talks about Mitt Romney's black grandchildren, right? Granddaughter, I think it is, right? That's, I mean, that's so he marches in favor of Black Lives Matter. But like, you can't, someone's going to change their minds after a very long and a very prolonged effort to explain to them, this is what white fragility is. This is what white privilege is. This is what it talks, when we talk about talking about your own whiteness and your own identity, that's what we're talking about. And so you have to think about, it's not just this moment, 
it's also all the other moments before this moment that led up to this one. It's like, you know, the kid with the dam and the, the finger in the dam in, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in Holland, right? It's one and another and another. It's, it's Katrina. It's, you know, it's everything that showed via video. Via, it's, it's Beyonce in formation. It's all these cultural <laughs> moments that showed Black people are here and we are angry and we are speaking out and please examine your own life and your own privilege and the benefits that you have. It's your segregated schools. It is the, the pandemic differential for COVID-19. It is all of that over and over and over again. And then finally, at some point, you are a white person who looks at your spouse and says, we need to talk to our kids about race. And that, I mean, that is, I mean gosh, to, to actually have to get to that point, think of how much work had to be done by other people to get you there. Yeah, I mean, that's such a great point. Um, so, well, let me pivot the discussion to let's do a deeper dive. Um, and I'll just start it out with two examples or stories that you guys have told. Uh, Michelle, I love your story about the nanny in the park on your TED Talk. I thought that mm -hmm. was, I, I was like, I get that. Like, mm -hmm. and Alexis, I, I tell it. Yeah. <laughs> and Alexis, I loved your, your Pitbull versus Lab post that you did on LinkedIn. And it seems like it is the implicit bias that we, we should probably start with, or if you guys want, if you want to start somewhere else, we can happy to do that too. But that's why I feel like we should start is what is it and how do we rip it out of our culture? So here's the thing. Yes, there are things we should be doing in terms of donating money, in terms of public policy. I'm really not here to opine about that. I am not an expert in legislative policy. So let's acknowledge those are very real things that we need to be advocating for, but we're going to set that aside for a moment. Something that, and not to completely speak for Michelle, but to speak for her a little bit, that Michelle and I do as diversity and inclusion professionals is we do talk a lot about personal responsibility and the role of changing what I will often call someone's default settings, right? Which is what can result in a level of bias. But the thing with bias is we have it ingrained in us across the board in so many ways. So I will say I am biased towards the color blue. I just like the color blue. And black, was, Alexis, be honest. Yeah, and stripes. I also really like stripes. black. You do like stripes. But, <laughs> but that, is, that is a bias I have. If, the, if it comes in multiple colors and blue is one of them, that is the one I will, I will choose likely. But I have no need to work to address that bias. And in a lot of ways, bias is what allows us to make quick decisions, right? As humans, we can't be in analysis paralysis all the time. Sometimes you just have to play the script, right? Like, you know what's supposed to happen when the light turns green. You don't analyze it, think of it anew. You just act. But the problem is when these biases affect how we view and how we interact with other people. So I want to first narrow us down to what sort of bias we're talking about. I'm talking mm -hmm. about bias as it influences and likely potentially negatively impacts or impacts other humans and how to raise awareness of it. So what we're seeing right now is a much broader discussion about how in the United States, we generally have a system of white supremacy. And I have to pause there because me merely saying that word will cause many people to be like, oh my gosh, are you saying that I'm a white supremacist? And no, 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 no. Think about That's how much fewer people that is right now than it was three years ago, like, or even like a month ago. Like that is how much the world has changed in the past month, but continue. Right. But to, we just generally speaking, and I know Michelle can add on to this, we live in a, in a country that values whiteness and we have systems in place that many, many would say intentionally were made to protect that whiteness. And even if not intentionally, what they just de facto do is maintain a power mm -hmm. differential or those in power generally so of our of institutions of you know standards of beauty of the types of band-aid colors you can get of the media you see on tv it generally depicts white people and that is i've been calling it the soup of values in which all of us are raised so what happens is you're this is how you got your programming your social programming generally values whiteness and it's for many white people, not, not all, but for many, it's something that they've never had to look at before because mm -hmm. it's the default and operates in the background. You don't even know it's operating. It's like when you call tech at, you know, IT at work and they're like, hold on, let me see what programs are running. And you're like, I didn't know there were 47 yeah. programs running. You have no mm -hmm. idea until they raised your awareness of it. So what we do is try to raise awareness of the programs and then talk about how to address them. But yes, what, where I'll start and then toss it to Michelle is that for many white people, they are not aware of how that default social programming, which values whiteness, affects their day-to-day -day life and how it affects their preferences and interactions with other people. Right. I think, so one of the, 
I love to read books, right? I love books. And I am, um, you know, I love specifically, this is where Alexis and I differ. I love fiction books. And the thing with fiction books is that you will read an author, right? Typically a white author. And they will go to pains to describe every other character by their skin color, right? The Indian person, the black person, it's always usually supporting characters, but they will describe it. But they will never describe their white character. They will never say the white man with the blonde hair or the white skinned person, because in their mind, whiteness is the default. The rest of us are not the default. Now you're going to go back and you're going to look at all your books and you will say that I'm right because I am. Because I know that because editors do not want them to put it's a white person in a book because they take those out. And why do we take them out? Because whiteness is the default. And you look at that and then you look at how we expect our kids to think that, if our white children to think that they are the default and they are the neutral and everyone else is an other and everyone else is a different. And because we don't think we actually are you know, a separate other, that our color is not nothing else but neutral, then I'm gonna say that I'm colorblind. Because you know what? I don't see differences. I don't see that this person is black or brown or, you know, or Indian I, or Chinese. I don't see it at all because I don't talk about it. It doesn't matter to me, but I live in an all white neighborhood and my kids are taught by all white teachers and my kids have all white friends. And when I look at my bookshelf, I have all white authors in there, but you know, race doesn't matter to me at all. None of that. I mean, that's just all a coincidence or I have never even noticed it. So when Alexis talks about awareness training, that's awareness or raising, that's the first thing we want to do. We want to raise awareness mm -hmm. that as a white person, you chose this, like you chose to start take your kids to like, I talk about kids a lot, like you chose to take your kids to the white dentist and the white doctor and enroll them in the school that doesn't have the large minority population and live in the neighborhood that doesn't have a large minority population. And that's because of that whiteness that we're talking about. And when we talk about the systems of privilege inside and outside the workplace, um, it is so easy, for example, for a lot of white women to see sexism. Like we can talk about how workplaces are sexist every single day, but how are we talking about how workplaces are racist? How are we talking about how workplaces exclude my value and my culture and they uh, accept me and expect me to assimilate to I can belong like everyone else? Are we talking about whether a workplace can see a black man as capable of being a CEO? Considering that I look at the Fortune 500 CEOs, I know the answer to that question. So when we think about whiteness, we have to think of it more as it's a neutral, okay, it's a neutral good. You know, it's a neutral, mm -hmm. nothing else matters. It is harmful. White privilege is harmful. White supremacy is harmful. And it is killing careers and it is killing people. And we need to accept that and acknowledge that if we are going to do the next piece of the work, which is to change it. Right. And then also within that, there's a couple things. So we talk about intentional discrimination. And then we're also in this land of implicit bias or subconscious bias. I like to think potentially naively, but just go with me here, that a lot of the time, particularly in the workplace, I don't think we're dealing with a ton of intentional, although I'm a former labor and employment lawyer, so I have no illusions that it still exists. But that implicit bias, because the bias, the default setting is white, it means even when well-intentioned, you will choose the person who's most similar to you. And so oftentimes, once again, perhaps being naive and overly charitable, I will argue that, and we often call this affinity bias, right? And it plays in different contexts, mm -hmm. not just with race, but we're talking about race right now. That it, in some contexts, it may not even be that you necessarily have a problem with, say, the black candidate. It's just that you really, really like the white candidate because you don't, you can't quite put your finger on it, but she grew up in the same hometown. She you went, went to, to the, the same, same college. School. You're in the same frat. And like, it's, these, you know? it's, the, it's these little nudges, these little weights on the scale. And the thing is, everyone has to look at their own behavior. So I certainly have things where I have my own proclivities for a certain sort of per person. And often I'll pick on, like as an example, the fact that I'm American. So when, when presented with somebody who's from another country, I may initially have that American like, okay, their English is not as good as mine. I don't know. Is it worth me asking them? Am I going to be able? And these are things that are hard to say, right? Particularly as a diversity person. Oh my gosh, people are going to think Alexis is biased. But we have to start admitting those. And it's Alexis in me. Is biased. Right. Yeah. It's in me. We all have bias, but it's in me acknowledging my discomfort and being like, wait, why am I automatically comfortable with this person, but I'm sort of, this resume, just the name makes me think she's probably not from the U.S. Is English going to be difficult for her? Mm -hmm. Should I even make that phone call? But instead, a lot of times we don't make, we don't even consider this. Mm -hmm. We just call the guy, we call John Smith 
because there are certain subconscious really? assumptions John about him. Smith, Alexis, that's the name you, you went with? My goodness, oh, sorry. really? Okay. terrible. But, but that is what I do want to make it clear that we are not just talking about this intentional, I hate minorities. Mm-hmm. But what we're talking about is the little stuff. Like imagine, just like do some thought experiments of a stranger walks at your, up to your door. How do you feel if that stranger is a white man? Do you assume he's a neighbor you haven't met? Do you assume he's you know, sent by the city to investigate something? How do you feel if that neighbor is a black man? Mm-hmm. And I would bet that most people, if they th- really thought about that, will note that they have a different internal response, mm-hmm. which I'll pause here, but that actually also goes into that example that I, I shared on LinkedIn about yeah. the you know, golden retriever versus a, a, a pit bull running at you. And Tricia, that's where it gets to the deeper point, which is, well, why do you have that reaction, right? Why do you have that reaction to that pit bull? Why do you think that the pit bull is more dangerous? Where did it come from? Who instilled it in you? And let me just back up if we can explain the, oh, sorry, I, I Alexis, explain the, the analogy. So I, I posted on LinkedIn, and this was before George Floyd, actually. And I will admit, I was not a fan of my post after George Floyd. Because well, I yeah. posted this after the Chris Cooper incident with the, what, the white woman calling the police on the black man who was bird watching mm-hmm. and who had asked for her to put her dog on a leash. And I was trying to think of an example of, you know, bias that we have. And I just wrote a short little thing about imagine you're walking down the street and a golden retriever is running at you. How do you feel? Are you, are you happy? Are you sad? Are you scared? A lot of people might think of Full House or how the Golden Retriever is the family dog. A lot of people would never be afraid of a Golden Retriever, even if you don't like dogs, you've never owned a dog. It's just not, it's just not scary to people, but it's, it's like an 80 to a hundred pound dog, depending or maybe more like I have a gold, maybe more like 60 to 80 pounds, but a big dog. Now imagine a pit bull is running at you. How do you feel? Are you scared? But did you know that, you know, back when we had, you know, like the little rascals, the pit bull was the family dog, that the pit bull was once America's dog? You don't. And note in those examples, I've said nothing about demeanor. I haven't said burying its teeth. I haven't said, you know, that it is aggressive. I've just named the breed of the dog. And you automatically most likely have an emotional response based on your conditioning, unless you're a pit bull owner. Most pit bull owners are on this campaign to show that their dogs are the most loving dogs that there, that there are. And the other thing is, this is not a perfect analogy. I should not be likening any sort of humans to dogs, but it was something where I thought it really showed how with limited facts, we very quickly will have a certain feeling. And we do that with people all the time, not just in the instance of profiling by police, but I think all of us can consider a situation where you were walking somewhere and you saw a type of person And if it's one type of person, you're like, oh, you know, that's fine. I'll walk past her. And another type, you might have decided to cross the street. And so we really have to start getting honest with ourselves about the types of people that we feel nervous around, Mm -hmm. as well as the type of people that we have an affinity to. So we can start raising awareness and then subsequently begin to check that bias. Right. And Michelle, I, think, no, I interrupted you. So yeah, no. So that's exactly the analogy, right? And you can also see why you, you didn't like that analogy after, after George Floyd. Um, and then, and then, and so then you do the awareness raising. And then the next step is what do you do next? You know, one of the, one of the reports that have come out that's talking about how we had all this implicit bias training for police officers for like, well, since, you know, since 2013, I believe we started with Ferguson, right? And yet, I mean, on a grand scale, we've had a lot of implicit bias training, but how much of a difference is it making? Um, By the way, they've been getting it a long time. My mother used to train police officers in diversity. There you go. The nineties. So, so, so let's, so that's why I think there's also that, you know, when you asked earlier about like, why has this happened? We, you know, we did this, you know, we did this seven years ago. We had the protests, we had the, you know, the review boards, we had, you know, the changes and yet it seems like we're still here because change does not happen overnight. It doesn't take seven years. It doesn't take a hundred years. It's a very long time. Um, so my question then is now that you have raised awareness of what bias is, now that we have done the work, let's talk about structures. And so when we're talking about how you change structures, when we talk about how we change institutions that unfairly benefit one type of people for all of the bias reasons that Alexis said, you have a couple options. You can continue to say, this is why your bias exists, be aware of it, or you can put into place systems that check it for you. 
And that's what we do. We put into place systems that check biases. We put into place systems that make you know, life fair. And a lot of the things that we talk about with in, inside law firms, like for example, because of affinity bias, right? Because of in-group bias, a lot of law firms, including the ones that I used to work for had um, free freelance, well, I can't even think of the word right now, Alexis, assignments where it was just free range. Why can't I think of it? Why can't I think of it? Oh, I can't think of it because you can't oh think of gosh. it. Oh my gosh. You, 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 you have to go get your own assignment. Eat what you kill. Whatever You're entrepreneurial. It is. I, yes. I, I cannot own. think of the world. And yep. let's talk open about market. open market. Open. I, that's it's, crazy. It's close to, it's close well, to that. So close. Free market to. assignments, right? Yes. Uh, we'll go with that. We'll go with that's that. Right. Anyway, whatever. But like you go find your own work, right? And the partners can pick who they want to work with. Well, the partners are going to pick who they want to work with and they're going to pick people in their in group because of affinity bias. And also because, you know what, they don't really, they have the biases again. It's not just biases for someone. It's also biases implicit and not against someone else. Um, so what if we didn't have a free range system? What if we actually had structures in place to ensure that every person who comes into an organization, into a law firm, actually gets assigned to the good work? And then we measure whether they got assigned the good work and we measure their success and their trajectory instead of just relying on partners who do not make the best managers to do that for us or um, recruiting. So my implicit and in my in-group bias says, I only like these top 12 schools. And because I only like these top 12 schools or top 14 schools, these are the ones I'm gonna recruit from, right? What if we had a system in place that said no to that? What if we had a system in place that removed you know, law schools? None of these are perfect solutions. And I wanna just be clear that none of this is perfect, but it is better than what we have now because what we have now is where we were 10 years ago in the legal profession with our, you know, our horrific numbers on, especially on black women partners, and is where we are going to be 10 years from now if we don't do something to change it. So aware, raise your awareness of bias. I would love if you as an individual could change and if you as an individual can be better, but I also recognize that our brain is lazy and it's going to it's continue hard. making these biases. It's going to continue making these assumptions. So when people are marching in the street asking for structural change, this is what they are asking for. They are asking us to put into place structures that ensure that the good apples and the bad apples are both subject to the exact same fair system that we have. And so you can be explicitly racist and you can be a really good, well-intentioned person, but those structures that we are going to put into place to ensure that we are treating black people, people of color, LGBTQ plus people with fairness and equality and dignity, it doesn't care if you're a really great person or not. So I love that. And I, I do want to do a deep dive into structures uh, that we can put into place. Before we do that, I just want to back up to implicit bias for, for a moment and the default settings. For, and tell me if I'm wrong. It seems like it takes decades for default processes and biases to make their way out of the culture. Is it, you know, it's, it, what's more important? Are they both equally important or is it more important to put structures in place oh. while they wake, make it away? Or is it important to rip that weed out of racial injustice as we're long we're doing. I know it's not a very articulate question. But well, and the thing is, and I know that we're not going to, we're not going to fundamentally answer this, but right. Let's, let's spin on it. Let's, let's, let's examine it. You, you, you need both. Mm -hmm. and, but in a perfect yeah. world, yes, we would all take ultimate personal responsibility and we would sort through all of our bias and all of our trauma and we would wake up the next day and we, then we wouldn't need the structures. But I have started thinking about in terms of fairness, which it's a really weird way to think about this and it may be overly charitable, but it is very difficult to say that for, hey, you know, if you're 40 years old, for 40 years, you have been programmed to, to, to have a preference for, for white people, whether you know that or not, and likely, right, for many people. And today, I'd like you to change that. That is very, very hard. But mm -hmm. what we often talk about in diversity and inclusion is doing the work. So a couple of examples that I don't think people will find as maybe like threatening or triggering. But a couple of years ago, I was on a phone call and somebody raised stay at home dad. Some contacts of someone was a stay at home dad. It was a call of a women's group. And one of the women said, oh my gosh, I just had a really negative reaction to the idea of a stay at home dad. I automatically thought like, oh, who's this guy? Can I get a job? And then she's like, I don't want to be that person. I need to, to check that. And it was interesting that she just, for whatever reason, stream of consciousness, shared her thought pattern. But what's going to happen is you're going to keep having the negative response for quite some time, but it's your ability to be like, oh my gosh, I don't want to view this person that way. Okay, what can I do in this moment to change it? An example I'll often talk about is, um, and Michelle will appreciate this because I was at a Michigan football game, a Michigan Northwestern game. I'm there with my pretty small children. Husband is a huge Michigan fan and I am not happy to be there because I don't like football. And yay, I get to stand while entertaining my then like 
maybe four and six year old, oh, we get so there, Alexis, right? So we get oh. there. We are in those tiny little bleacher seats that aren't even a real seat. It's just a number. And there's maybe three open numbers next to me, but I like five guys fill in. They are pressed against me. They are presumably drunk. And I play that these are frat boys and I am pissed. Like I'm so angry that for the next four hours, I have this. And I played the story, the frat boy story that a lot of people would not fault me for particularly in the United States, right? We know the story. We think of animal house. We think of drunkenness. We think of, you know, like debaucherous behavior. But I played that story. But I like to think because I do this work, after about, I don't know, four to five minutes just being annoyed, I turned and I was like, well, if we're going to be in such close quarters, I should probably introduce myself. I was still a little sarcastic because I'm still me, but he introduced himself. (laughs) Turned out he was a Northwestern law student. Turned out he'd worked for the governor of Illinois we talked for the next 90 minutes. He's now at a very large law firm and we're connected on LinkedIn and we may become, like we may be friends that will probably go for coffee at some point. But I played the script about who he was and most people in that scenario and most of the people who sat around me, they were, they were angry too. And nobody would fault me for it. Nobody, because we do generally have a negative narrative about, and in this group, this case, it was a group of white men, presumably ages like 22 to 29, that were in a fraternity. But in me pausing to be like, Alexis, is it fair that you're playing this story about this person? And me instead speaking to him, I completely destroyed the narrative because I personalized him and I made him a human and not a story. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's the work that we need to do because it, it, it's really accepted to have stories, taking it back to our topic, about Black people. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what, you know, you you said, Trisha, at the beginning that you watched my TED Talk. And I I used the story. It's if you haven't watched my TED Talk, you can. It's We Are Not a Melting Pot because it's talking about how everyone is, it should not give into the assimilation ideal that we are all the same. Um, But I talk about being, you know, I am in my predominantly white neighborhood with my two children and my children are biracial. So they're like very light brown skin. But it honestly does not matter if my children are white or black. But I'm with these kids. I'm with my kids. And all of the white moms in my neighborhood on the playground, they assume I'm the nanny. And the fact that they do that is because they have what Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie says in the best TED talk I have ever heard, which is the single story, which is exactly what Alexis is talking about. You have a single story about someone and you have a single story about who they are and what their background is. And that single story is informed by all the archetypes from the media and from the books that you consume and from your life and especially from your parents who raised you. And if you allow that single story to dominate, then nothing will change because you will only ever believe that single story. And that single story is, you know, those boys who are next to Alexis sitting on that game. It is the single story when you think that, well, it's all the 476 to 500 CEOs of U.S. companies are men. Then when I am, my name is Mike and I retire and I'm probably going to put into place another Mike to go behind me and he's going to hire another Mike. And that is the story. It will continue to be forever until you do the work to change it. So to your question about structures and bias, yes, I think you're not going to change a structure unless you either are forced to or want to, right? That's what I said at the beginning. So instead of forcing people to change and marching and having people march for their lives outside gosh, wouldn't it be great if our legislators actually wanted to make some change happen? Wouldn't it be great if they actually believed that Black Lives Matter and they are of equal value and equal worth? Until they all believe that, and until they continually interrupt those biases that they have, then we are going to keep marching and keep going out there and telling them and forcing them to face up to the fact that the structures that are in place are unequal. And that, I mean, I think that means you want both, and in an ideal world, you would have both. But it takes a really long time, like Alexis said, yes, to get to it that takes a long one. time. Well, and also to, to follow up on what I said and what Michelle was saying, back to the, what was the term you used, Michelle, for this? It was just the one story. Oh, Is that it was what? brilliant, whatever that term was. Uh, well, the single the, story. The single story. Mm-hmm. So back, back to the single story. The single story is so pervasive that even when you are presented with things that are counter to it, depending on how deeply inculcated it is to you, you will not change your narrative. And so for me... You know, I've had to deal with race in a number of ways in my life. Obviously, I'm, you know, director of diversity and inclusion. I'm a black woman. I went to predominantly white schools. Like Michelle, I too am in an interracial marriage. But growing up, I would frequently get that, oh, but you're not really black. You're not like black, black. You're, you're really like an honorary white person. And that is a prime example of you are being presented with something counter to your narrative in front of you 
But mm-hmm. instead of changing your idea, you put me outside of it so that you can maintain most likely whatever is a very negative viewpoint of what it means to be black. Because what you're telling me is I really like you. You exhibit what I view to be positive attributes. And because you exhibit them, I don't consider you to be black. Right. And it's that not is, that I can, yeah, it's not that I can change the story and the narrative that I have of you. It's that, no, you no, know, you're you just don't, an exception. Yes. And when you're not willing to change these narratives, your, your ideas, I heard someone great say, when you won't change an idea, that means it's an ideology. And that is problematic. Mm, and there are so many times that I think people well-meaning, whether it be in the context of black and white or other race will say, oh, but you're not like the rest of them. Instead of questioning their beliefs about them, that mm-hmm. fully epitomizes the way that these biases are created and just how, how entrenched they are. And if you keep unpacking that, so not only do you have an idea of what it means to be black, I'm going to presume it's negative, but who taught you that black, that whatever is even stereotypically black is bad? Mm-hmm. Where did you learn that? Why wouldn't it be okay if I acted, you know, whatever your stereotype is? And so there's a lot of things to unearth there, but I would say that I have had a number of people in my life say the equivalent of that to me in one way or another pat themselves on the back for it because they have a black friend so they can't be racist Mm -hmm. yeah and not understand that they just told me a lot about their views of blackness Mm -hmm. and in those moments particularly when you're young you don't even know how to begin unpacking that because you know so and so is your friend and you think she was trying Mm -hmm. and so you don't necessarily have the conversation plus like so when you when you when you when you are, know that there is a stereotype about about people who look like you, and you know it's a negative stereotype about the shoes that they wear, or the clothes that they have, or the jewelry that they wear, or the music that they listen to, you know what you as a black person in the workplace spend your life doing? You try not to be them, right? You work so hard so that no one ever thinks that you are them because not that there's you know that there's nothing wrong with them, and this is something that. If you ever read How to Be an Anti-Racist, it's a great book, but he talks a long time about that kind of racist belief, that there is something wrong with them. And you work so hard to think, okay, if I just wear the right clothes and the right shoes and the right jewelry and listen to the right music and say the right words and never once say acts instead of ask, people will accept me as one of them. And it is exhausting. And then what, you know, especially what the Chris Cooper case revealed, but like all of these cases reveal is that no, it doesn't matter how perfect you are. It doesn't matter how hard you try because you're still black. Like you're still going to be black. And recognizing that and recognizing how that is not equally valued in many places in this country is what really hurts and what really cuts you down. So going back to what you said about earlier about bias and yet we need to in the single story and having that single story. And like Alexa said, where did it come from? Why do you have it? And what are you putting into place to counter that? Because otherwise you're just going to have that single story for the rest of your life. Yes. And why are you holding on to it so, so tightly? And this brings up another thing that I think is actually quite difficult to talk about. And I hope that people are charitable and listening to me say this, but I also found that a lot of times when you're in the majority and you are not accustomed to navigating these conversations, there is this urge to want to throw in the towel. Mm -hmm. I tried, I said the one wrong thing that one time when I was trying and I'm, I'm done with this. Like Mm -hmm. whenever I say something, I'm taking the wrong way. And therefore, and the thing is back to, to privilege, like you actually have the privilege to opt out that when you are made uncomfortable in your trying to say, you know, I throw my hands up. And I, and I do think to some extent, the move towards being colorblind, it, it's, it's, I hate to say it, but it's a bit lazy. It means mm-hmm. I don't need to navigate any of this. I will see everyone as the same. And then I just don't have to deal with this because mm-hmm. this is not something that I should have to deal with. So enjoy doing what you do. I'm going back over here where I don't have to think about this. And it will not affect your place in society, right? So there's a great uh, quote, I think it's by Helen Coe, um, about silence is the privilege of the powerful. Because Alexis is right, you can be silent. You cannot talk about this. You cannot address this. I had a friend once who's a white man who said that he had no idea that his law firm had affinity groups. And I was like, how could that be possible? I was like, well, you know what? I get it. Why would he know that there was a black group, an LGBTQ plus group? Why would he know about any of these groups? Because as a white, straight, abled man, he didn't have to do any of it. He doesn't have to do any of that work. You can go home tomorrow, open up your book, read your newspaper, you know, watch your news, watch your shows, and never think about Mr. Floyd's life. You know, yeah, these protests are happening, but I, can, I still get my paycheck. I'm still going to work. 
and I can still do this and I can still go on. And that is what privilege is. I mean, I cannot think of a better explanation of privilege yes. than the Which, ability to not do anything. Well, and that has been interesting to me because there's a lot of outreach. There's, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't do this, but I have received a lot of outreach from white friends checking on me. And for some, we are close and the outreach is appropriate. But for others, there is a hollowness to it or a performative empathy aspect to it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it sounds like, I am sorry this is happening to you. I am sorry this is happening to black people. And the underlying mm -hmm. message to me is I am otherwise unaffected, but because I know you, I feel bad. And that is really difficult for me to understand and relate to because back to what I said about these are human rights issues. We watched an unarmed person murdered on film. And I think that should viscerally affect everyone just as human beings. And if for some reason you're unable to muster the, the empathy or the outrage, it further speaks to your conditioning as to who you are willing to be empathetic for. Mm -hmm. And that is also something that needs to be examined. Yep. Well, let's, and there's a lot of talk about the work, right? And, and I, is there a way we can put some of that into actionable tips, the work that can be done to start to undo that, that bias and those default systems, the single story? I want you to start by picking up a book. I want you to start by learning. So, I mean, like that, you know, I, there have been, oh gosh, I can't even think about it. Like millions of articles shared in the last two weeks about how can white people be allies? How can they get better? And what can they do? And then those are all great. And I, those are valuable pieces of advice, but the first of that needs to be, you need to be better at empathy and then you need to read. So go read books about what defund the police actually means. Go read articles about what it feels like. There have been many black people who've written about what it feels like to be me at a workplace go get some explanation, some, some background, some evidence for if you think that the real issue is black on black crime and why is no one talking about that, then I want you to go and answer your own doubts. I want you to go do your own work. I want you to go do your own research. Um, you know, I, it's, someone came to me, is like, well, you just tell me that when I look at my life and I look at the friends I have and the circle I have and the mentors I have had, this is an exercise I gave people in a Medium article and the teachers that I have, should I go out and like, and they're all white because for a lot of white people, most of them are white. Um, I should go out and get myself five black friends. I'm like, no, because that's not friendship. But also it's a matter of just acknowledging that it exists, right? It's acknowledging that, you know, whiteness is not neutral or it's default. It is an active choice. And that is what I want people to acknowledge. So reflect on your own life, go do some learning. And then like Alexa said, learn how to empathize with people, learn that how to how to respect and value them and to not gaslight them. If I'm a black person in your workplace and I'm telling you there here are the five things I'm asking you to do for so I can succeed here. And you keep telling me that I am wrong and you keep telling me that that's not the way we do things here, then you're gaslighting me. So either you don't wanna hear what I need to tell you or you don't wanna do the work. So I want you to want to do the work and then I want you to do the work. But, but I also think, so in doing the work, understand the level of discomfort and I feel like Mm -hmm. The idea of discomfort sounds fine until you're actually presented with something that's uncomfortable. Understanding that you're going to encounter things that are uncomfortable, but there are so many resources out there. And that's what's interesting about this time. We're now in the information age. We now yeah. have and Google. We have, people who, we have people who have been providing tools and access for years and years. It's just that for whatever reason, the broader collective wasn't terribly interested in them. What I don't really want you to do, though, is to find a black colleague, a black friend, and ask them. Can you explain to, it to me? To, to put the burden mm, on yeah. them to educate you. It's one thing to tell that person that I am starting to learn and educate myself and have realized how I'm really unaware of so much. Would you ever be open to having a discussion with me about your experiences and asking their permission? But I do think frequently, back to the shortcuts, back to the how do I make this easier, the default becomes I need to find a person of color in real life and have them justify to me why this is real. Mm -hmm. That is what I don't want you to do, especially in the face of so many resources out there. But ultimately, and as hard and emotional and scary as this is, you have to just realize that, that everyone has their own version of this in some way. And it, it is okay. What we want you to do is admit it or not even admit it, acknowledge whatever those thoughts are. And it's the slow, incremental, when something rises, when that person knocks on your door, back to the, oh my gosh, okay, it's a black guy, my door, I'm a little afraid. You have that micro moment 
in your mind where you're like, wait a second, wait, should I, be, why am I extra afraid? Like what's going mm-hmm. on there? And it sounds like a lot when I describe it, but we all know that we, we've done that. And to get even a little more kind of far afield, this is why I think having mindful practices, anything that's going to help you slow down. So for some people, it's formal meditation. For others, it's, I don't know, sports or writing or whatever. But whatever allows your brain to not always be in the do, 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 act, 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 but allows you to have just like a half a second to pause, Mm -hmm. you really have to cultivate the ability to respond and not merely react. And mm-hmm. that is hard. It is life's work, life's work stuff, but it's something absolutely worth pursuing. Well, that's great. I'm going to drop some of the, um, the links that you guys mentioned in the show notes. So if anybody's looking for the books or, or whatever which we talk about today, we, you can find those in the show notes. I want to circle back something to what Michelle said is even for, for Black people in the workplace, how they you know, can feel the need to conform to what they see. How do we stop that from happening? It's hard because, I mean, so much of our workplace has been told that you can't bring in different emotions. And this is not just Black people, right? This is, this is women. This is LGBTQ plus people. And even in those workplaces, like I work in a lot of startups, right? So I go to a lot of startups and I see like the new culture and it's all like bring your authentic self to work. But it's performative authenticity. It's like bring the authentic self to work that we think is acceptable and we think is cool. But is it when you're angry? Is it the authentic self when you're like, you know what, this isn't the right way to do this. Here's a new way to think about this. Um, Is it your authentic self when you're like, I actually think I can go recruit people at my black church instead of going to the typical places where we recruit people at. What does it really mean to be authentic? What does it mean to be different? What does it mean in your workplace to allow people to work differently? I mean, we haven't talked about COVID yet, but like one thing the pandemic showed us is that if you force thousands of companies to think differently in the space of like a week, they will pivot and they will make it happen. Why can't we just do that for everyone? Why can't we do that for people who have different ideas of how work should be, should be performed? I was on this really great podcast with the, um, the head of the YWCA and she's like, we have never called it flex work, right? We have so many women working for us that we just call it work, right? We make the hours work. It's not flexible work. It's not childcare responsibilities. It is just part of how we do work. Why can't that be a part of the workplace? So to your question about how we change and make someone thing less assimilationist, my question starts with the people who are in charge and the people who have power, you have the ability to change things. It is just really, 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 really hard to change things because it's just hard in general. It's just hard to change. It's just hard to think of a new way of doing things differently. But then you saw with COVID that, you know what? It's hard, but it's not impossible. So what I want you to do is to talk to your people. I want you to ask me, it's not just inclusion, like what resources do you need to be successful here? It is what resources do you need that you do not have access to? What ways of thinking are there that we could be doing differently here? What processes and procedures can we put into place that would allow you to be successful, to you to be your best self? For you, and this is what I talk about all day, the values that you have, the ones that you have outside of work, the ones that I want to matter here. What can I do as a manager, as a leader, to make sure that your values are recognized? That's it. That's all I'm asking people to do. And it seems like it's hard, but it's really not. If you are a good leader and you're a good manager and you are, you know, you have the ability to do that. And to what Alexis said earlier, it's empathy, it's kindness, it's respecting someone. So, or we could just do what we've been doing for a long time and telling black and brown people, especially that if you assimilate, you will succeed. And if you need us to pull up the numbers of the vast numbers of black and brown people at the highest levels of every single company in corporate America, we are happy to do that, but they don't exist. So let's try something different. When when you put it like that, oh my God, it's like, why, why isn't everybody doing that? Like, I, I don't, it just, I don't know. It just, it seems. Because why would you change something that's working for you? Why would you possibly, I mean, the reason we changed in the pandemic was because it wasn't working, right? It's not, we can't have people come downtown into their offices. Well, they were forced to, to. like there was no choice. Yeah, there was no choice. That's what we're talking about. There was no choice. So they were forced to change. So, and that's what privilege part of what it is. If you have been benefiting so long, especially if you are a successful middle to upper class white male in the workplace and you have benefited from these systems, why on earth would you change them? What is it for you to change them? So, I mean, I can talk all day about why that's, we should, that's why we need to stop making the business case, but 
the people case. Like, let's talk about people. Let's talk about the people that you are leading. Let's talk about the people who are leaving. Let's talk about the people who you want to talk about how great your company is and how great your organization is. Let's talk about the people who are going to be your clients. Let's talk about the people who are watching you on social media and seeing your performative Black Lives Matter statement. Let's talk about that and understanding that that is what I need from you as a leader to care about people and to make people matter. So it's hard. It's not impossible because we've seen it done. What, ca- what are some of the things that we can, from a law firm perspective, we can put into place to make sure that we have an inclusive culture, that we are making sure that we're hiring uh, black women, ethnic others, and that we are making sure they're advancing. And I know we mm-hmm. a little bit talked about that with Alexis, but I want to do that kind of again and, and, and see where we are. Should I jump in first? So let's start at the beginning. It starts with where you recruit from. And this is where the conversation, it's a little bit fun in that this narrative has not changed in years. It's just that there's a lot more attention on it right now. Michelle and I did a presentation on this in 2017 called mm-hmm. Recruiting and Retaining Millennial Attorneys of Color. And it was, it was actually for, for now, one of their, their annual education conference, but you have to broaden the pipeline you have to, was it the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? So if you keep going to the same schools and you keep applying the same metrics to those schools and then you keep using maybe that same recruiter or you keep posting your job in the same place, wherever it is for your new hire to your lateral candidates and you're not changing it at all, but you're expecting different results, that's the definition of insanity. Mm -hmm. So in terms of speaking to this moment that we're in right now, you could recruit at historically black colleges and universities. You can recruit outside of top schools, which I realized, uh, Tricia, when we talked earlier, you mentioned how that, you know, at your firm, it wasn't so much that that, you know, that was the concern, but we talked a bit about how to get information about your firm in front of the eyes of different sorts of people and how not to rely on only internal referral networks because those will result in more of the same. So, from the recruiting perspective, the first part is doing something differently, but back to the concern about, I think, fear of trying something new and lawyers were a little, we're concerned about innovation because what if I fail? For all of this, you have to commit to this being an iterative process. There is not going to be anyone, there's nobody who can point to their organization and be like, we fixed it, do what we did, it's 100%. So what you need to do is do something. And so for a small organization, it might be that you start with your interview questions and you actually have standard interview questions asked of everybody that are not just tell me about yourself because as lawyers we tend to just be like hey i just read your resume so tell me about yourself maybe that's what you did maybe you standardized your interview questions but there's just there's so many little places you can you can start but so in recruiting it's kind of like the world is your oyster Mm -hmm. just pick one to do differently and see what your result is and then depending on that modify accordingly. Yep. I have, um, so I have a book coming out later this year. It's called Authentic Diversity. And it's really to what we talked about earlier about performative versus authentic. What does it mean to actually allow people who are different to be different and to succeed? And so I talk about like the five old rules of diversity, which I think are don't matter anymore and we have to stop using them. But then I talk about the five new rules, right? The five things I want people to do. Like people-centered leadership is the first one. And the second one is something that a lot of my clients just don't do. They don't have their data. Like, what does your data say? Where, where, where are your, where, okay, let's, okay, let's pick me as a black woman. When I started at your company or your law firm, what did I start as? Where, who did I work with? What work did I get? As I continued advancing in your law firm, compare my trajectory, because eventually I'm going to leave because almost all of us leave, to say, and the person I like to use in my books is Dave. Compare my trajectory to white man Dave. What was he getting? What work was he doing? Who was he working with? When he becomes an equity partner in 12 years, can you see how our paths differentiated? And if you can't see that, then how will you know what you need to change? How on earth could you possibly know at what point I need different resources or different access if you have never measured where our paths diverge? So I'm asking if you're going to do this work, you need to go and look. You need to I mean however you want to measure data. You can do interviews, you can do surveys, you can just look at feedback forms, you can look at evaluations, you can talk to people and ask them what it is that they need. But please, like if you're gonna say, wow, well, I really, really think I need to recruit more black partners, how many are you starting with? Do you have one? Do you have two? Then if you get to five, that is more than doubling your number. But everyone's gonna like, well, five is not that much. It is a lot if you started at two. So thinking about what your data is showing you, 
you know, when I get my resumes in and I'm looking at my resumes, which resumes am I rejecting off the top? Which resumes make it past the first level? Once they pass the first level, which resumes actually make it to the hiring committee? Which ones do the hiring committee reject? When they do their interviews, who is rejected again? And what is, I mean, going back to what Alexa said at the beginning about bias, what does all that data show about what the, where the biases are? So that's the second one. And then the third one is what Alexa said about recruiting and where you're recruiting from. And this like lowering my standards argument, which is never about lowering standards, but it really is about, you know, Okay, Can I we pause on this for yeah, one yeah. second so as well? Standards? Well, yeah. I just need to pause because what this movement is showing us, so many people, their eyes are now wide open about systemic racism, mm -hmm. okay? I wasn't going to say racism. I wasn't going to say it. But Whatever. Go Discrimination. Ahead, systemic, the, how, and, I'm, and the thing is, caveat to everything we're saying, all ethnic minorities are underrepresented. We're just talking about black here because of what's happening in the world right and now. And who we are. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But- we are now more willing to acknowledge systemic discrimination um, against black people in this country. Doesn't it make sense that that has also affected the schools that they're able to attend for law school? And doesn't it make sense that that's going to affect the, how they're going to adjust to that environment? So what you do see for many students of color or first generation, not exclusively, by the way, I'm not speaking for everyone, but you can see trends is if you're first generation, going to law school or to college is an adjustment. Mm -hmm. And the first, whether it be your freshman year of college or your one L year of law school, those grades usually reflect that, that the social adjustment, potentially an academic adjustment, but, but often there will be a, a tremendous upward trajectory. And the way we often recruit as lawyers does not allow for that Yes. at all. Yes. And that's really really problematic. So it's not a matter of lowering standards, but also a matter of looking at your, your standards or your metrics. Do they even rationally relate to success at your firm? Have you run analytics on successful partners at because, your firm? Because, yeah, the only partners that are successful are the ones who went to T14 schools, obviously, right? Because we, right. no one has, who has ever not gone to a T14 school has been a Rainmaker partner. Right? Oh my and gosh, so, no. So anecdotally, a few firms are running this and they're finding actually it tends to be the partner from like the second year school, yeah. second tier school, that did the best. So why is it that you're demanding that all, to your, hustle. Right, that all of your talent be from a small group of, of schools? But then also when you do look at, say, grades, for example, if somebody was working full time while supporting their family or extended family and managed to get a B average, that seems to me back to the hustle to be far more emblematic of somebody with grit and the things it would take to succeed within your organization than somebody who's not. So here's the problem though with all of that is this is hard. Mm -hmm. This is going to take a little bit more of an individualized approach. This is going to take nuance. This means we probably just can't be like, you need this and you need that. Then we yep. can come talk to you. So it's more work. And, and then it goes back to the original question. Why do people change? They're either forced to change or they want to change. If you're a law firm right now, what is your incentive to change? Is someone forcing you to change? A lot of the clients are trying to. A lot of the younger associates who are not coming to your firms, maybe that's part of the, maybe that's part of the stick. Or do we use the carrot? Do we make you want to change, right? And that's, right. and I think is part of the challenge because a lot of law firms are really, really profitable. Yeah. And so the I stopped you. system makes them profitable. So. And I stopped you at number three, but ultimately it's not lowering standards. It's revisiting mm -hmm. your standards to make sure they bear a rational basis to success in your organization. And, then and revisiting your standards to see, did they always privilege a group? Like, did they, were those standards created when we knew that a certain group was only once allowed into law firms? Have you, since that time, ever looked back at them? Well, yeah, just to reiterate that point, you have to take a hard look at your, your values. So if this is a, we're doing this because we're afraid, we're doing this because there's a lot of scrutiny, I would submit that you're not going to be able to sustain this. This has mm -hmm. to tr truly be baked into the values of your organization. And if it's not, you probably need to start with why. I would mm -hmm. not suggest that you identify a bunch of diversity goals or, you know, initiatives because chances are that in a month or three months or six months, yeah. you will no longer be pursuing them. Right. When I do my workshops with leadership, I always ask them, what is your why? I mean, that's the, like, that, that is also the last chapter of my book. Like, what is your why? Why are you doing this? And I actually, I do remember what I wanted to say. I want to go back to what you said about small law firms. So small law firms are some of my favorite clients because they can change. They do not have the decades of entrenched culture. They have a small partnership body. They have, they know each other and they can tell me as a talented, you know, black law student that if you come to this law firm, I will invest in you as a person. I will treat you like a human being. I will in, you know, invite you to the groups that I think you should be a part of. And I will champion you. I will do more than mentor you. I will champion you inside and outside of this workplace. 
And so to my small law firm, people who are listening, you have the ability to do that. You have, and you have, you have the flexibility to do that. And it's not impossible. It, it thrives with treating people as human beings and taking it from there. Well, I love that. We'll end on that substantive note. I, I feel like we could talk for like another hour, but um, we, we'll end on that substantive note. So happy that you guys came on. I'm Thanks hoping at us. least we, we had a legit discussion. <laughs> I at least started one. Michelle, where, if someone listening wants to hire you to come into their <laughs> law firm and help them, where can they find you? Change the world because that's what I love to do. MichelleSilverthorne.com. You can find me there. It is the easiest way to find me. And if you would like to buy my book, I was very excited because after last week, I finally got some good news on Friday with my publisher. And this book was coming out in October. It looks like it's going to come out in August. We just have to finalize that. But you can find all the information at my website. So michellefilmstorin.com. Awesome. Congrats on the book. I love it. Alexis, I know you have a podcast coming out, right? When, when's it dropping? Oh my gosh, this is a lot of pressure. I know. This is public. No, it's actually, I'm working with my firm, Foley and Lardner, that, that we are looking at releasing a podcast. I'm not going to say much beyond that because okay, you know, right. I'm it, could, on the spot. Sorry. it could take you some did. time. It could take some time to get out. But for those, you know, interested in following me, look for me on LinkedIn, you know, feel free to connect or follow with me. But if you have questions on diversity, you may ask me, but chances are I'll send you to Michelle yeah, because I, I do, I enjoy working on my, my day job, which is with, you know, my wonderful firm, which is Foley and Lardner. And if you're looking for a consultant to come in and help you with your And tell you the I truth. You to, I will point you to Michelle. I'm pointing down there. <laughs> Michelle is liberated. That's right. There's like the, 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 the truth hurts, but yeah, feel free. I mean, I, I love talking to people and I love changing worlds. So that's all we can Love do. it. And reach out. If you guys have not connected with Alexis and Michelle, reach out to them on LinkedIn. They put out a lot of great content. So with that, thanks guys. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for listening, Thank everybody. You. Until next time on The Defense Never Rest, we will see you then.